Demons and Angels, part 19. I'm Professor Anders Dreitungheis of the First Assembly of Jaffa Shua in South Africa, Pretoria, Montana. Should you require any of the books which I've written, or have any questions, or the restoration of the original Sacred Name Bible, the Rottenham version, please contact us at 0722-367-124. That's WhatsApp and your international code plus 27. Or just go to my webpage, https double point of hyphen Yaffa, Y A H H V A H, Y A H V A H, it's Yaffa, point C O P on Z A. If this is the first time that you are participating in the study, Demons and Angels, I urge you to go to part one, otherwise, you would have missed quite a bit of information. It is very important to subscribe to the channel to be able to receive the notification of all the other studies that we are currently busy with. It is free, the notification. Share this link with your friends and family and make sure that you have your 611 King James Bible pen and paper ready for notes. Hallelujah. I trust that this study will be a blessing unto you in the name of your Yahushua. Welcome to Breakfast with Prof. Hannes. Now, we must listen to what the researcher says here. The old Babylonian tales of intercourse between gods and legend, legendary heroes and of books containing heavenly wisdoms, which thus make to occur with Jewish legends. However, in order to avoid contradiction to the monotheistic characters of Judaism, why they were ascribed to the world as angels. And what such example was Yenoch? Now when we look at Yenoch, I just want to say here, uh, in South Africa the book of Yenoch is playing a very large role, it's like a Bible, to the uh, Israel vision groups who believe that only a certain portion of the white people in South Africa are Israelites. Uh, and the book of Yenoch is playing a major role there. Now the book of Yenoch, for, for those who does, does not know, was only written in the 16th century, 1642. Uh, when you read the book of Yenoch, I have one, we will find it does not have an author, it has a publisher, and also in the book, back of it you will not find a bibliography which will have any references. So any book to me as a professor without a full bibliography in the back is like some sucking. It's like some articles, of most articles on the internet. You can write just what you want. You don't need to give a reference of anything. And you know those are the things that get infiltrated in the minds of a lot of people. And that will change their minds and they will believe a lie for the rest of their lives. So the book of Yenoch, I mean Yenoch was caught up into heaven alive. That he wrote the book before he is gone or have he had memoirs or what does he have? Uh, they had Pokemon roll scrolls, no, no, there was nothing. These things, uh, stories that was made by the Freemasons, in the 16th century, which became part uh, of the of the teachings, like all the uh, apocalyptic books, there's 17 of them, apocalyptic books, the apocalyptic books, which were actually part of the Roman Catholic Bible, which was removed, uh, and you know, of course, that the Book of Revelation. We're near the part of the Roman Catholic Bible. So when Protestantism came to existence, they took the Apocryphic books out, the 17, and they brought, Protestantism brought the book of Revelation back. One such example of Enoch, a figure of creative under the influence of Babylon concepts, who appeared as the barrier of creator of human culture and the transmitter of every wisdom, to the early generation of man. His authority is diverted exclusively from his constant 
communications with angels. He had constantly, there's no book that says it. There's no scripture that says that Henoch was in constant communication with angels. This is part of a new age theory. I have to share this information with you as well, so that you can compare it to the word of Yahweh. It's not used any use if I only give you the right hand side, the right hand side, and never bring any left hand theology in so you can compare it. Various sources treated Noah and Abraham in the same manner, ascribing their wisdom to their intimate knowledge of the world of angels. In addition, various religious concepts uh, accepted the Jewish people under the influence of pagan magic and uh, demonology. Yeah, they, especially when they re were released from, from Egypt, demonology played a big role and the pagan gods in the lives of Israel after being in cap captivity for 420 years under uh, the Egyptians. They served pagan gods. They believed pagan uh, uh, rituals, or they believed in pagan rit uh, rituals, which found its way into the life of Israel as well. And that's why throughout the life of Israel, we will so many times find Israel when they turn to pagan gods, pagan gods. It's part, part of, as if it is part of their DNA. They want to serve idols. They want to serve uh, other gods. They were never satisfied with only serving one Elohim, which is Yahweh the Elohim. They looked at other nations, heathen uh, Gentile nations, and when they see they serve different gods, they also want to serve different gods. And that's the history of Israel. And that's why we have a lot of these things today in Jerusalem. A lot of pagan religion rituals must relive. Now there must be a third temple and they and they already built, built the, tab, the, 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 the altar and they've got the menorah and the tab and the altar uh, uh, and the, co uh, the covenant is made. What? Out of fiberglass. From what did they make it? Because it's not the... You see they want to replace everything of the Old Testament. Uh, with something that looks more or less the same. It's like artificial flowers. I mean, this is artificial flowers. My wife, Pastor Rika, she spends a lot of time with her flowers. Doing the flowers. Yes, we, we have a lot. She's got a lot of orchards and other flowers. She loves flowering or gardening. And sometimes we will bring in real plants into the studio and we will use it when it's time for them. But in the winter you don't have these plants. So what I'm saying, they look alike, but they don't smell alike. You know, see what I'm saying? They look alike, exactly. You can touch them, they feel alike. But there's one difference, it does not have life in it. So because when we look in the scripture, when we look in the word of Jaffa, there's life. It's vibrant. It's alive. And that is what religion must be to us. It must be something that we are living in. Not the religion theologies of the world, but the revelation word of Yafa al Elohim. So it says here that Israel was so used to worship pagan gods and also all, always wanted to do what, the, what the, 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 the Gentile people did. We're living in the time of the great lie. Did you know that? Yes, the Bible says we're living in the time of the great lie. And you know what is the problem or what is the creator of the great lie? Internet, a computer. I have a computer in front of me with all my notes because it's impossible with all the research and stuff to have everything right up your mind. 
So what do we see? We see through internet that a lot of things is, is offered to people. And people that have, does not have the spiritual capacity to see the difference between a lie and the truth. They are just caught up in it like that. I've seen this many a times. They will rather believe the lie that they read on the internet as the truth if you show them in the word of Jaffa. They will not believe it. I'm so glad we have the Ruach HaKodesh that lead and guide us in all truth and righteousness. So, the Israelites were always busy with paganism. And the Bible teaches us that, especially in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, 570 years uh, AY or BY, uh, before Yahushua, because they were for 570 years before Yahushua, they went into bondage, into slavery. And they just bent their knee, accepting the pagan gods of Babylon. And even if I look at the so-called religion today, people are just willing to accept the Babylonian or mother's teachings. You see, the greater the church, the greater the, the more pillars it has and the more uh, glamorous it looks. Oh, you know, we are worshiping at that church and it looks like that and that church and some mega church is like this. We are. You don't even know the pastor, man. You've never even shaken his hand. But you're part of it. No, you're, you're buying your way into it because you're just tying and tying and tying all the time. Paying money to be a member of it. Never in the word I see one scripture says we must go and build a church. Not once had Yahushua ever said to his disciples and apostles, go and build a church. Go and build a building that even looked like a church. He never said it. He says, go from house to house and break bread. Not meaning giving everyone a brown bread or a white bread. No. What are we doing? Every time that I'm speaking to you, we are breaking the bread of life. Hallelujah. I'm so glad I don't need the church. I've got a computer in front of me. Yeah, but the, we need to gather in... In, in a church. No, it doesn't. Every time that we are together, we are gathered in the name of Yahushua, led by the Ruach HaKodesh, through the blood of Yahushua, the redemption blood of Yahushua, being in the presence of Yahweh Almighty. Yes, but we don't sing and we don't shout and we don't run. That I call spiritual gimmicks. You don't need that. I don't find this in the Old Testament. I don't find this in the, in the Scripture. This has been created from the 16th century in Protestantism. Why? Because the Catholicism from 34 AD has created this image of certain things and walking with a, with a silver jar and smoke coming out, a little Gino coming out. And can you imagine it? And the priests and the cardinals and they all in a fancy dress. And then you see the Pope with his mitra. And it's all looking impressive. But it smells like death. Unfortunately. It looks good. It looks good. But it's smelling like death. Then I rather will worship and study the word. Because the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name. It didn't say where two thousand, three thousand. It said where two or three are gathered in my name. There I will be in their midst. Because He never intended for us to have churches uh, where we are sitting with a million, pe a thousand people, two, three thousand people. And you know all the debt in building a church like that? Do you know all the debt? No. I'm so glad that we can be two or three in the name of Yahushua. And, uh, you know, because it's not a special appointment that we do. 
to have association with the Ruach of Kodesh. He is here. He is here. The moment that we walk into the studio, Father Yafa, Yafa Shua, through the Ruach HaKodesh, is present in the studio immediately. Why? Because He lives within us. He doesn't live in this church with all the pillars and all the different things, Freemasonry signs and all these things. That is for the eye. And that's confusing the mind of people. The greater the building, the greater the church. I rather want to be humble and worship with those who are humble. Because Revelation 18, verse 4 says, comes out under her. Who is that? The Babylonian whole mother of Revelation 16, uh, 17. Revelation 17, verse 1 to 6. She sits on the waters and she rules. Who's that? The Roman Catholic Church. She rules. She's clothed in purple and scarlet and precious jewels, crosses and everything. But in her right hand she has a golden mug, golden jar, full of the blood of the prophets and the children of Yahweh. She rules over them. She sits on the waters and she rules. Revelation first, uh, uh, 17, verse 15. Then I rather want to sit with my brothers and my sisters and let's study the word of Yapa al Elohim. Now, yeah, till tomorrow morning, if it's Yapa's will, Maranatha. Yapa Shua is coming back again. Hallelujah.